carpets, rugs. Did they start out as carpets and then the room got bigger? You might find out, and I don't know about that with Jim Jeffries. I didn't even hear the music. <laughs> Is it done? No, I heard the music it for stopped. a bit. Don't worry about it, Jack. Just start it stopped the podcast. Through. Jesus Christ, we're going to have a professional production. Two of our <laughs> two of our people, Luis and Forrest, are home. Can I say why? Are we allowed to say why? You're keeping this secret. Yes. Uh, they've both got COVID. <laughs> they both we got, were making out. Yeah, they've both got COVID. <laughs> two separate incidences Worked of COVID. Through. I was with Forrest the weekend he got COVID. We don't know how it happened. We were only gigging in New Orleans, Texas, and Oklahoma, <laughs> and it just happened out of nowhere. But I was in a car with him for four hours every day for like four days. Forrest did tell me that there was a guy who came up to him and was like just talking very yeah, closely to his face. I mean, everything that, that I, you know, <laughs> look, if you're vaccinated, like we all are, it's very hard to get it from other vaccinated people. You're most likely going to get it from an unvaccinated person. Viral load is heavier. There are antibi- any, you know, antibodies aren't coated all over the virus. And there was one guy that after a show came from behind me and like was like right in my face. It was like, rrr, rrr, cool shirt, whatever. And it was like, <laughs> if he was any closer, he would have been making out with me. And I was just like, all right. And I backed away from him. He was like, spit on me. You know, not on purpose, but I bet you wish you didn't wear that shirt now. (laughs) That's why I wear a basic black t shirt. I never want anyone to come and say, cool shirt. There you are with your panda t shirt. You got to get COVID again if you want to dress flashy like that. Uh, Something important it's it's, it's the ninth right now. Uh, Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but we have our live show tonight. So if you don't have tickets yet, go to loopslive.com. Live show. We just did shows in, in, in LA. They went wonderful. We've just announced more tour dates. Jack, where are are they just off the top of your head? Orlando, Tampa, Tampa Pittsburgh, Edmonton. Edmonton, all over Canada. We're doing all over the place. Go to jimjeffries.com. Tickets are on sale now. If there's a pre um, sale code, the code is moist. Uh, if they're just on general sale, you can get them now in general sale. But we've just announced like another six months worth of gigs. Um, so that's. And I'm sorry for everybody that was going to go to the Canada shows that I advertised for two weeks. Yeah, not allowed to go to Canada with COVID. Is Apparently, it? they got strict rules. Old, <laughs> old COVID Joe over there. He uh, <laughs> he's not he's not allowed to go in. Forrest lost his sense of smell and taste. Yet uh, he, he's still eating a lot. Or what's happened there? Did they put you uh, off food? Yeah, yeah. Is that me- muscle memory? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I know what Taco Bell tastes like. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I'm a texture guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, it's, it's, it's weird because I, my sense of smell, I'm on the down end of it now of the COVID and I, I didn't, wasn't too harsh the, the symptoms, but I did lose my sense of smell and I was able to smell my own shit again the other day. So that was exciting. Oh, yes. 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 Me up, Cause I've been ringing him each day. He's had COVID for about five days or six days already. And I rang him up. I said, how are you feeling today? He goes, oh, good day. He goes, I was on the toilet and I could smell my own shit. He started cheering to himself. <laughs> that's, when, that's, that's when you know you're on the mend. Imagine how foul that must smell to a to somebody without COVID. Well, though. I said maybe it's just a particularly pungent shit. Oh, maybe, yeah, maybe it was just that his other shit's it's a been, spicy one. Yeah, it yeah. broke through the, the, yeah. the, the bad senses. Maybe because he can't smell and eat. He's just been eating mold. <laughs> It's made his shit extra pungent. <laughs> and Luis, you got COVID, what, from drinking out of a cow's udder this weekend? No, no, I was the one wearing the cow udders. Mm. So what? whoever took a circle, <laughs> I dressed as a cow for he Halloween. Dresses a oh, cow. he dresses as a cow and for Halloween. And he had a working udder with four different valves yeah. that you could drink so from. So everybody and they, at and your party has COVID. Tequila on the valve? <laughs> yep. Right, so yeah, how, many, how, many people, how many people did you give COVID to, Luis? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was telling Kelly, I feel worse for the person who sucked my penis, but it was a joke. Oh, you know, why would you wow. repeat that? Is, why would you repeat this that? Is, uh, I didn't is, even uh, laugh when you texted it to is, me. Uh, no, we immediately <laughs> made fun of you. Like, why it, did you say this that? This is why we don't let Louise talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The first time he talks, she goes, I feel sorry for the way you, you said it. was so good. I feel sorry for the way the woman who sucked my penis. Louise, was she your third or fourth cousin? <laughs> Yeah, come on, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you forget that delivery is very important in comedy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What's funny? I was. Ah, uh, oh, we lost yeah, you yeah, again. Yeah. The irony that our sound guy is fucking <laughs> the sound doesn't work. Here you are. T- tell your story mm-hmm. about that woman who sucked your dick and got COVID. The irony is what? And now she's in fucking hospital on a respirator. <laughs> 
And I was going to deliver it with a lot of confidence, but I realized my mom's just right next door. <laughs> in the, in the bathroom, you, probably, so. you probably gave her COVID when she sucked your dick. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you time a joke, my friend. Oh, poor Anna. <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> uh, the, uh, we got a little announcement. Uh, a, a friend of me and Jack's, really, uh, Mick Malloy, is just retired from Triple M Australia. I do his show once a week, mm-hmm. and always on the show, they're a champion of this podcast, and they always play a little snippet of the podcast to our Australian listeners. It's one of the biggest radio shows in the country, and Mick has decided to call it a day after working for the station for eleven days. But last time we were on the show, Mick always goes. I just want to play a little bit from your podcast. And normally he plays a bit that's like 10 seconds long where I say something stupid and then he goes, what happened there? And then I talk about it, right? This time he said, I have a clip. I don't know if you two heard this. Uh -uh. I have a clip of you talking about The Bachelor. And then he played the clip. This is the clip. Oh, no. This is a clip of our own show we're playing back right now. On Triple M all around Australia, you are listening to Malloy. I don't know about that is the name of a podcast that's available. It's with our next guest, Jim Jeffries, and it's always a great listen, Mickey. Jim, how are you, mate? Thanks for joining us. Good. Thanks for having me as always. Hello. We've been listening to your most recent podcast, and there's many bombshells in uh, your latest, including <laughs> your passion for The Bachelor. Here's just a sample from the latest podcast. We're going to be talking about The Bachelor, which is incidentally one of my favourite TV shows, and I'm quite open about it. What's with Katie? She says she found true love, and she still goes f-ing mental in the Final Rose episode. Claire, Dale's too far out of your league. What were you f-ing thinking? And she did that whole speech. I will never apologise for love. I always thought that they would dress, because everyone looks so immaculate. You have to bring your own clothes. Yeah. You think that I, as a man, would like to watch The Bachelor because there's more women to look at, but I like to see the blokes have a bit of an argument. And probably get three group dates, and someone who really wins will get three solo dates. That's the big thing. Can I steal you for a moment? Yeah. That Italian guy that no one likes. Oh, Juan Pablo? Juan Pablo, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the guys were like, I cannot believe yeah. that you want to be The Bachelor. He was hit up on Instagram. He's a gorgeous man. In person. Oh, my <laughs> breathtaking. <God. laughs> he lived on a farm that had a population of like 150 yeah. Chris, people. That there's always a bloke with a guitar who find a reason yeah. to sing whenever he can because his love for you is something that you don't understand. Right, so Straight, didn't they have like they had two girls right, in one episode? Shut up. Okay. Shut up. <laughs> You're all in. There's a bit yeah. to unpack there. It's fucking fantastic. <laughs> it was non stop. How do we Where get they, that editor on our show? Where do they play? You go, oh, this won't last long. And I was just sitting there going, oh, God. <laughs> Well, music cues. Uh, first of all, thank, thanks to them for playing our podcast all the yeah. time. That's, that's really nice. That, that's too bad. I mean, if, hopefully he's retiring because, you know, he's, he's going to relax and enjoy himself. Uh, he's, been, uh, he's been a legend of radio for a very, very long time. He's probably going to play this bit right now. <laughs> yeah, he probably, but he, he's been a legend of radio in Australia for a very long time and he'll probably go and do something. But he's also got like one of the number one TV shows in the country. So I don't know how busy a guy has to be. It know? is funny yeah. because that episode, there were so many people that were like, why the fuck are you doing an episode on The Bachelor? Which obviously they haven't seen your stand up in a while because you talk about The Bachelor in your stand up. Sure. But he's passionate about it. He loves it. And well, most of those so- people who said that didn't even fucking listen. Listen to the also, episode. we do everything from cheese to war. Yeah. And that's somewhere in between. Yep. <laughs> yes, it is. And, and, I and, think it's closer to war. I, I watched The Bachelor last night. I didn't get all the way through it with the baby. It's so hard to keep up for a three-hour episode. So <laughs> yeah. I've, I've still got an hour and a half waiting for me when I get home. So I'm Wait, over there. The Bachelor's there. three hours long? Oh, sometimes, yeah. And yeah. then other episodes, like two and a half, and it's like, wow. and then sometimes they'll give you two episodes a week. It fucking goes. Yeah. It doesn't stop. It's a time commitment. This uh, this week, you wouldn't believe it. There's a bloke who threw a fucking jacket in the pool. And then it was, it was classic bullying. So he didn't like this one bloke. So, so this bloke goes off with the girl, oh, no. Michelle, goes off with Michelle. And he's, he, can I have some time with you, please? And he goes off and talks to her. And he's like, that guy disrespected me. Now he's going to learn what disrespect is all about. Oh, so no. the guy got his jacket. You know, we learn off the podcast, they have to buy their own clothes. Yep. They have to buy their own clothes, and he got his jacket and he threw it in the swimming pool. And then the and like everyone's like, dude, if you react, then you'll get kicked off as well because there'll be two people fighting. You have to be the bigger man. 
And so the guy, like, when you're bullied, it really hurts your feelings, man. And so he sort of cried and he, he went to the hotel. He goes, this guy's pushing my buttons, man. <laughs> <laughs> so he said to the producers, he's pushing my buttons. He threw my fucking jacket in the pool, man. How is anybody not interested in this show Why when you hear would, these descriptions? Like, and you're saying it goes for three hours. How can you not fit? It, there's not enough time. There's not enough time. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, and I was watching, I got, I, 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 I didn't. I think this is a good time to tell everybody that this will only be about The Bachelor, this, this podcast. <laughs> I, 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 Astrology. I, I did Nick Vile's um, uh, podcast because mm-hmm. he did ours. I went and did his. That's how the podcast world works. And I went and did it and he told me that Clayton's going to be the next Bachelor and they haven't announced it yet. He's still in the season. So my uh, wife had picked Clayton as one of her bets to win. So she's, oh, she's already lost that bet. But he said that they'll have to edit Clayton really good so he looks really nice because he's the next Bachelor. So he mm. could just be fucking punching people and but he could get so away with it. Are you allowed to say this? Yeah, they've yeah, already no, announced no, it. It was, it was leaked. Then Nick said this to me on the on the podcast. He said it to me like, oh, maybe off. I'm not sure. Anyway, it's out now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's definitely, it's definitely out there. All right. All right, let's do some ads. Do some ads. Today's episode is sponsored by Honey. It's not my wife. I call her honey every now and again, but she doesn't. <laughs> we sponsor. love honey. If if I if she sponsored the podcast, it's my money anyway. <laughs> Today's episode is sponsored by Honey. We all shop online, and we've all seen the promo code field taunt us at checkout. We have promo code. You don't have a promo code. Well, boom, boom, I do. I have Honey. Thanks to Honey, manually searching for codes and coupon codes. It's all the thing of the past. Honey is the free browser extension that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. Honey supports over 30,000 stores online. They range from science, from tech and gaming products to popular fashion brands, food delivery, anything you can think of. Wood. Yeah, they've got them all wood, (laughs) wood sites. It's simple. (laughs) Shop as you normally would on your favorite sites, websites, that's what it is. Mm. It's not just just like landscapes, (laughs) right, on your favorite websites. Honey will automatically search for its best coupon codes on the internet and apply them automatically to your cart. All you do is get savings with no effort. I don't know if you know anything about me. No effort's my thing. Yeah, it's Ooh, really yeah, big. On, it's yeah, that's my your brand. thing. I use the honey. I use the honey. I got, uh, I got, uh, I had to buy a birthday present. Yeah. Yeah, buy a birthday present. And then I put it in website I normally don't go to. Then I put the honey I in. genuinely don't know why anybody wouldn't use it. Like, you're already going to buy these things online. You might as well just get the money off, put it back in your pocket. Whoa. Makes no sense. Oh, uh, I know. It, like, if let's say it was a Brewster's Million scenario and you had to spend a certain amount of money, <laughs> a certain uh, amount of time. That would be you the only acceptable time to yeah. not yeah. use but honey. I think that they'd figure it out. They'd go, <laughs> I think he's trying to spend the money. He didn't use honey. Mm. Yeah. Honey maybe. has found it's over 17 million members, over $2 billion in savings. Ooh. That's $2 billion in our pocket, not in theirs. Might be why the economy's stuffed. <laughs> uh, if you don't already have honey, you could straight up be missing out on free savings. It's literally free and installs in a few seconds. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this podcast. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash IDK. That's joinhoney.com slash IDK. Going to the grocery store during the pandemic has been a nightmare. Mm -hmm. I don't go. The other day it was like a full nightmare. There was werewolves and stuff everywhere. (laughs) Oh, no. And then you woke up naked in Trader Joe's? It was was Halloween. Uh Oh. People Uh, were were buying chocolate. mm, But it felt like a nightmare. Mm -hmm. It's not worth it. Forget the store. You have food come to you. Mm Mm-hmm. No, you have to go to the store. What are you living in the Stone Ages? Yeah, <laughs> bloody the Flintstones. Have you got have you got a pelican that works as a dishwasher? <laughs> you look like a moron. <laughs> Green Chef has a meal plan for every healthy lifestyle: keto, paleo, plant based diets, or even if you just want to have a delicious but balanced dish. Green Chef experts create every recipe with over thirty meal choices every week, and the flexibility to switch plans. You'll never have to sacrifice taste. For nutrition, you can enjoy restaurant quality dishes in the comfort of your own home. Enjoy new and nutritious recipes each week that are perfect for you and the whole family. And the pre cooked portions, easy to follow recipes delivered right to you. Eating well has never been simpler. Never worry about having to plan or shop for dinner again. Green Chef is the first USDA certified organic meal kit. So you can enjoy a hand-picked organic veggies and premium proteins without having to worry about where they came from. See, my wife's a vegan. Mm-hmm. I, it means a lover. Didn't you guys have a meal this week? 
the you said something about the sweet potato and mushroom yeah, tacos no, or we something. Do, we do know. I, I mean, my wife, we get the plant powered boxes. Yeah. I, I do that with that. We we just had the yeah, as you said, sweet potato and mushroom tacos, and they were very delicious even for plant-based products. <laughs> they weren't as good as if we had meat in them, but what are you going to do? <laughs> that's a wife problem, not a green chef problem. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the green chef are doing the best they can. <laughs> Must be red. For, go to greenchef.com <laughs> slash I don't know 125 and use the code I don't know 125 to get, oh, this is why they say 125, to get $125 oh, off. $125 That's off. That's a lot of money. Including free shipping. Go to greenchef.com slash I don't know 125 and use the code I don't know 125 to get $125, including free shipping. The number one meal kit for eating well. All right. Let's introduce our guest. Uh, please welcome Larry Lawton. G'day, Larry. Now it's time to play. Yes, no. Oh, yes, we don't no. Know. Yes, yes, no. no. Judging uh, a book by its cover. Okay, okay we're, we're, we're short of Luis, as was mentioned earlier. <laughs> uh, okay, so Larry, I'm sitting there, I'm looking at you. You've got a lot of inspirational quotes before you. A uh, person who falls and gets back up is much stronger than a person who never fell. That's very true. Unless, of course, they became a paraplegic or something. <laughs> and then they're, they're, much, they're much weaker than when they started. <laughs> but I think we're talking about metaphorically falling. Um, okay, uh, there's a okay, YouTuber. So you're uh, Larry, you're a YouTuber. Uh, yes, I am. Yeah, okay, so he's a popular YouTuber. I, I want to say that Larry's here, Larry's an influencer, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> I, I want to say that he's here to talk about influencing. Oh, really? <laughs> what type of influencing? The, the youth into taking drugs. <laughs> 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 that's, that's how I got into it. No, uh, okay, is your specialty? I'm, I, I don't because I'm judging a book by a cover here. Is your specialty got something to do with cars? No. No. Okay. Has it got to do with health? No. No. Uh, has it got to do with showbiz? Mm, a little bit, but not really. Not directly. Uh, okay. So there's like a reality show of what he does. Uh, like Dog the Bounty Hunter or something like that. Fuck oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I've been watching Dog Fuck it, hell. I'm fucking bald. <laughs> well, I saw old Dog in the, what's the name, that girl who went missing. I saw he was on the oh, case. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah Gabriel how the fuck did Dog ever hide behind someone's house? He sticks out like a sore thumb. <laughs> he looks like a fucking raisin in a wig right now. Like he's, he's not looking good, the old Dog. You well, know. Dog the Bounty Hunter is tangential related in terms of uh i guess the law enforcement or the you know getting people to where where what we're talking about are you a cop larry you have to say uh, yes if you are that's the law <laughs> no, no, listen that that's a so-so question a so-so question what's that mean well because it, it's part right and part wrong okay so you're a detective private eye no no all right i give up all right. We, uh, I'll just introduce him. Lawrence Larry Lawton is an author, YouTube influencer, speaker, teen and young adult expert and law enforcement consultant. Uh, Larry developed the nationally recognized reality check program and co-authored Gangster Redemption with eight time New York Times bestseller author Peter Gollenbach. Larry appears regularly on national TV and radio as an expert on crime, prisons, drugs, teen issues and law enforcement community policing. Larry is the only ex-con in the United States to be sworn in as an honorary police officer and only ex-con recognized on the floor of the United States Congress for his work with helping young people and law enforcement agencies connect with the community. His book, Gangster Red Redemption, is available through his website, realitycheckprogram.com, and his podcast, The Real Deal with Larry Lawton, is on all major platforms. So, Larry, can you just uh, walk us through, how did you come to be an expert in prisons? <laughs> well, well, you know, that, the bio is probably a little off. How I usually say it when I'm on stage, I'm... I'm still known as the biggest jewel robber ever in the United States. Uh -huh. I robbed between 15 and 18 million. I was associated with the Gambino crime family. I went away for not telling. Let me get that straight. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and, I, and I did four 12-year sentences. I was in prison. When I was in prison, I was tortured by guards, strapped down naked, beaten, pissed on, got my law degree. I, am, I can't be a lawyer because of my record. I had one of the worst records in prison. I was in maximum security prison and I've been on Con Air 16 times. Oh, cool. And now I developed the number one program in the country, helping young people stay out of prison. 
uh, blew up oh. YouTube in a year and a half to 1.3 million uh, subscribers. Okay. And, uh, you know, it, it's funny because when he did the cop question, you know, I don't like cops. But then again, I'm an honorary cop, the only one. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's kind of funny there. But and then in Congress, uh, you know, also as a man who, who's recognized on Congress, I figure, fuck, there's 435 congressmen, 100 senators. And I probably got the least record out of all of them, the real record. <laughs> so, uh, but and then, you know, when I open what I do to, to we're going to get into it, uh, what Jim's going to know is. Well, I, I told you, Kelly, is it Kelly, right? Yeah. Is it Kelly? Yeah. yeah. Yes. I, I told you, Kelly, something. I'll tell him if he ever catches it. Well, we'll, we'll a couple of stories that'll Perfect. probably shock him. And I have a very big audience in Australia. And just for you, Jim, to say, I loved your show. I loved your comedy. Oh, thank you. I uh, still do. Uh, Mike Marino, you, I think you know him too. Oh, I comedian. love Mike. Yeah, I like Mike. Yeah, he's a very good friend of mine. I'll be seeing him uh, in November uh, 13th down here in Boca. And uh, I, I guess I'm glad to see you. And, and wow. great. Really enjoyed you. I'm glad to see awesome. you, mate. Thank you. It's very, yeah. very sweet of you. Perfect. Well, let's find out what Jim knows don't about. Call it, don't say sweet to an ex-con. Oh. You know, uh, it, it could get ugly. <laughs> that's, that's why we got you on Zoom, mate, just to keep it safe. <laughs> All right, so this part we are going to run through these questions. I'm going to ask Jim What's everything. What's specialty subject? Prison. Though? Prison. Oh, yeah. I know a bit about prison. I've watched a lot of Locked Up Abroad. <laughs> so I'm going to ask Jim everything he thinks he knows about prison. Um, I'll be taking notes as well, and then we'll go back we through. We lost Jack. Jack, yeah, just, Jack, Jack just, just walked out. Just he got down. intimidated yeah. is what happened. Went and shut himself. Um, all right, let's get started. All right, so can you tell me the difference between like a federal prison versus a state prison versus jail? Federal means the entire country. Okay. State means the state that you're in. Uh, I guess I, I would imagine, I've never really thought about that. I imagine uh, if you're involved in a state crime versus a federal crime, um, a federal crime meaning that you embezzled money from different states or something like that, or your crimes crossed across borders or what have you. Uh, I, I assume a federal prison's probably more hardcore than that of a state prison, but maybe I'm wrong on that. Um, and then jail is just like where you get locked up for the night when you've been naughty, you put in the drunk tank. <laughs> By the way, just, just, uh, Larry, at the end of this, uh, these questions, you have to grade Jim on his accuracy zero through 10 and 10 is the best. We want to know how Jim uh, did. Oh yeah. So. Oh, yeah. Sorry about it. that. Okay. I forgot, I forgot about the, uh, the categories. Okay. So if Jim gets a 21 through 30, he is prison wine, 11 through 20 prison sex. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Jack's got something to say. Jack, just co right. just come sit down. It's a shit show oh, already. Down, uh, zero through ten, prison of your own mind. Oh yeah, yeah, I've lived in that one for Perfect. a while. <laughs> All right, what type of crimes land you in federal prison? Uh, murder. Okay. Uh, being a jewel robber. Jewel <laughs> robber. <laughs> jewel robbers of bit one. I imagine rapes one of those ones that would always be in there. It's a pretty good one. Raping a jewel robber. That'll get, <laughs> <laughs> that'll get you in there. <laughs> Perfect. What is the shoe? Uh, I have no idea. I have no idea what the shoe is. Yeah. S-H-U. 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 S-H. I have no idea. Okay. I don't, I don't know. Um, I've, how I've stayed out of prison my whole life. <laughs> Good work. Uh, what happens during booking? Uh, that's when you go in. I've seen the Blues Brothers and that you give them their watch and they put it in a little plastic bag and they give you your money and all, your, all your stuff they put it in and then they give you your orange jumpsuit. And then you get all that stuff back when the class is over, which might be, <laughs> which might be 12 years or so. Um, why are inmates transferred from facility to facility? Um, there could be a number of reasons. Overcrowding could be a reason that they've transferred. It could be that for their own safety, maybe they're getting in too many fights. Maybe they're causing too many fights and they have to be moved to a more uh, secure facility. Uh, maybe they could put in a petition to move to another facility so that they, their relatives can visit them. Okay. Um, what is rec? Uh, that's the rec center. It's where you go down and you uh, you get one hour of uh, one hour out of uh, outdoor. Act that was weird. Do you get in that little pop? Yeah. Yeah. Go okay. Louise, mute yourself. Yeah. There we go. Should have said that to him years ago. <laughs> um, so so you get one hour outdoor rec activity where you go, you play basketball or you fashion a shiv or something like that. <laughs> Ask me how to fashion a shiv. I know how to do that. 
You get a toothbrush and you file it down. Something to do with your bed springs. I've watched enough movies. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the black box? The black box is a thing that goes in airplanes that it uh, can't be destroyed when it lands and it will have the recording of everything. And every comic has made the joke in their day, why isn't the whole plane made out of the same material? Am I right? It can't be destroyed. <laughs> that's actually that's a good question. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, all, we all laugh at that. Uh, what kinds of jobs can inmates have? Uh, well, historically, making license plates was a big one, making license plates, doing laundry. Uh, you can run the library like Brooks from Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> um, you can be a cook. There's that one that they did on Comedy Central where they make pizzas uh -huh. and they do that. Uh, so chef, a lot of them learn hairdressing because I saw oh. a thing on this that hairdressing is, is a thing that they learn and then afterwards they can't get a job if they have felony charges as a hairdresser. I know. Um, so it's like a skill that they learn that's a bit useless. Um, there, there's, you know, anything to keep a small community of people up and running, you know. You need people cleaning, cooking, running the, the, the maintenance sort and stuff, I don't know. All right. What is Con Air? Con Air is when they're shipping federal prisoners from one spot to the other, it's prison plane. So you go in there in shackles and you have a flight and you think the meals are bad on United. <laughs> <laughs> you, should, you should go on Con Air. The, <laughs> the seats don't recline. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, God. And you go like this, but TV's not working. <laughs> and they go, well, what do you want me to do? We're in the air. The Wi-Fi's $16? What the <laughs> fuck? Yeah, yeah, con, con Air. They're all Con Air, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is helicopter wire? Um, helicopter wire, uh, I assume it's something you choke someone with in prison. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of wire that you come and you, you strangle someone and make them their, your, your bitch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can inmates get drugs? If so, how? Well, they can get them shipped in there the way they get everything inside a birthday cake next to a file. <laughs> There'll be a thing of drugs. No, they'll also have people bring them in. The guards will be paid off and they'll bring in drugs. Mm. A lot of stuff's made in toilets. I know that much about prison. If you want to make something, get in your toilet. You can have wine. I saw one where they were talking to people on different levels of the police station. So men were talking to the women upstairs by putting cups into the toilet and they were chatting to each other on different floors. And then they mm -hmm. were flushing things, messages to each other. So that doesn't answer your question. What was your question? <laughs> can inmates get drugs and how yeah, you answered that question? Yeah. They get drugs. People get them in and then they get paid off. And then, you know, like in, if you watch like locked up abroad, there's like there's in Colombia and stuff like that. The prisons are just like, that their their villages inside the walls, and they just have the guards down the outside, and they throw you in there. And it's like good luck, yeah. And it's sort of like Lord of the Flies shit. Um, which movies show the most accurate portrayal of prison? Uh, the movie Life with Eddie Murphy and <laughs> and uh, Martin Martin Lawrence. Okay. It's a good film. It's, not, it's an underrated Eddie Murphy movie. That one. It's a good laugh. It's always on telly. It's good fun. <laughs> Um, uh, Shawshank Redemption, I wouldn't believe it'd be a real, although it has rape scenes in it and stuff like that. I, I, I would say, <laughs> I would say, um, uh, what was that? Uh, the, the America X or whatever, the one with Ed, Edward American Fur History X. American X. History X. I would say that, that was pretty accurate, that what, one. What about Con Air? I just watched that for the first time Con last Air, night. Con Air is as accurate a film as, <laughs> I had a friend who watched Con Air and they said, that was a great documentary. And I said, it's not a documentary. And they went, What? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine thinking that was a documentary. Okay. The Longest Yard with Adam Sandler. Pretty yeah, good. yeah, yeah. You know, the Longest Yard with Adam Sandler is a remake of a Burt Reynolds movie called The Same Thing, which was a remake of a, a soccer movie that was in Britain. And then that movie was remade with Vinnie Jones. There's been four versions of this Whoa. film. It's all the same thing. Professional athlete goes to prison, makes the team good. All right, moving on. Let's go. <laughs> uh, where is the most dangerous prison in the country? <laughs> San Quentin. San Quentin. I'm going to say San Quentin. Or everybody in the documentary, San Quentin. All right. And uh, two more. What's a stand-up guy? Uh, oh, he's uh, he's a guy who's in the mafia, like our friend Larry. And they go, hey, he's a stand-up guy, that guy. And he's uh, he's rep by the mafia. So you, you don't fuck with him when he's in prison because he's a stand-up <laughs> guy. Perfect. Okay. And what do prison reform advocates want change? Like what are their main goals? Um. I don't know for sure what they want to change in particular, but I do know that other countries focus on um, uh, redemption more than um, punishment. 
Uh, so they focus on giving people skills and all that type of stuff rather than reform. Reform is the word I was looking okay. for, reform more than that. So maybe they're looking more for reform and less for punishment. Okay. Can you ask Jim one more question? Yep. How does bail work? Bail is an amount of money that is signed by the courts and it is assigned to you mostly if you're rich, they try to get you to have more bail so that you won't, uh, so you'll pay that so you can leave uh, and, and uh, until, your, in, until your trial happens. And then once your trial happens, uh, I don't believe you do get it back. We did a whole episode on bail once. I know, that's why I asked you what it yeah, is. Yeah, I don't believe you do get it back. And I believe it's very hard <laughs> because if you're poor, any amount of money is hard to get. And how long can somebody be held before their sentencing if they can't um, afford bail? I'll hold you as long as you want, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you want. All right. Well, then, uh, Larry, how did Jim do on a scale of zero to 10 in accuracy? About a four. Yeah, man. <laughs> Yeah, I'm very proud of that. Very proud of my lack of prison knowledge. <laughs> I, I'm going to give him a grade on confidence. His confidence was actually was high, really so I'm going to give him a nine on confidence. So we're at 13. When you go to the prison, this is what I know, Larry. The first thing you got to do is walk up to the biggest guy there, punch him in the fucking head, and then he'll beat the shit out of you. But it doesn't matter because everyone will know you're tough and no one will fuck with you from then on. It's the only thing I know about prison. Nailed it. Punch a strong bloke in the head when you get in. Nailed it. You watched way too many movies. <laughs> Forrest, what do you give him on a with The wrong guy, you might be his woman for the rest of the time. Or yeah, but no uh, one else could, would fuck with me. Really <laughs> <laughs> Only he will. Well, that's true, but your asshole is going to come out about the size of a, a softball. Oh, Jokes I, on you, his oh, asshole's I, already that big. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know it was going to tighten up from the experience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Forrest, what's your grade on, et cetera? Minus eight. Minus yeah, eight. Minus okay, eight. so yeah. what, we're at five? <laughs> so you're in a prison of your own mind, Jim. Yeah, fine. I'm Pretty always, good. That's where I always was. 10,000. What could you do with 10,000? You guys. Oh, you might find out in a second, Forrest. Oh, okay. I'm glad you inquired. Guys, you have to try 10,000 clothes, whether you're a big fitness guy or you just want to be comfortable hanging around the house. 10,000 makes the highest quality, best fitting, and most comfortable training shorts I have ever worn. And I tell you what, I, know you, I wear a lot of shorts around the house. I'm a shorts guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, wear, I remember the first time I ever saw your knees. Oh, at yeah. the uh, at the old show, and I was like, "That's never forget that. That's day. interesting." Yeah, yeah, that was, was got a, knees. I didn't that, know that was a day. <laughs> I have been wearing their seven inch uh, interval shorts with a liner. Uh, I have friends who need the twelve inch. Uh, oh. but my one, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I'm, I'd be I'd be good with a four inch pair of shorts. <laughs> Nothing's gonna poke down the leg. You'll be fine. <laughs> and their versatile shirt, the interval shorts are the most popular, most versatile style, perfect for gym days, spinning, short runs, uh, and backyard workouts. It's packed with features like silver ion for permanent odor protection. Oh, permanent's a normal word. Permanent. Uh, a permanent <laughs> odor protection. No bounce pockets. Not like those stupid bouncy, bouncy mm -hmm. pockets. You know, you put the shorts on and bouncy, yeah. bouncy, bouncy, bouncy. <laughs> what am I wearing these dumbass bouncy, bouncy, bouncy shorts? These ones have no bounce pockets. Breathable, which is good. You know, my dick needs to breathe. And lightweight <laughs> shell fabric. And an optional liner. That is very comfortable and prevents chafing. Unless you want chafing. Maybe you're a yeah, chafing person. Yeah, some people person. love chafing. Yeah. Mate, if you like chafing, don't get 10,000. Because <laughs> 10,000 stop the chase, chafing. Not for you. The Versatile shirt is the perfect workout shirt. Lightweight, breathable, and durable. They have gear for all types of workouts from running to, to hit. What's hit? High intensity, high intensity interval training. Oh, I won't be doing that. But if you people do that, you might want to get these, uh, these, these clothes. To spin or to boxing or however you train, they have the short for you. As the holidays approach, ding, did ding, 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 Christmas is here, da, 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 need to get gifts, right? As the holidays approach, 10,000 gear makes a great gift for any fitness enthusiast in your life. 10,000 is a direct to consumer company, no middlemen. So you get the premium fabric trims and techni um, uh, techniques that other brands simply cannot afford. Their fabric feels real luxe and high quality. Mm. They have over 10,000 five-star reviews, plus free shipping and free returns and a lifetime guarantee. 10,000 is offering our listeners 15% off your purchase. Go to 10,000, that's the words, 10,000.cc and enter the code 
IDK to receive 15% off your purchase. That's 10,000.cc and enter the code IDK. When the moment, I do this more sexy, this, this ad read. When the moment for intimacy arrives, you need to be ready. <laughs> Roman ready. Whether you've been in a relationship for years or just getting started, having the confidence that comes from preparation means that you're free to enjoy the moment when it comes. <laughs> That's <a> fun. <laughs> that was a bit much. <laughs> Even though you are far from ordinary, the truth is that ED is really common. In fact, 52% of guys aged between 40 and 70, not me, okay, a little bit me, uh, <laughs> aged between 40 and 70, have some form of erectile dysfunction. Go mm -hmm. to GetRoman.com slash IDK now to speak to a US licensed healthcare professional about erectile dysfunction and get $15 off your first month of treatment. I've had this before. You're not ready for the moment. You mm -hmm. pop the blue pill, off you go. You're ready to go. I have hair tablets that bloody stop me from uh, too much. Roman <laughs> really is confidence personified. It is a self-assurance that comes from knowing you've prepared yourself for the moment when intimacy arrives. Roman's system is completely confidential and totally discreet. No big logos or labels on the packages. I used to use these other companies they're called Erections. Yeah, right? it's just a and picture of a dick on the outside of the box. they just had a dick with a little jizzy thing <laughs> coming out of the thing. And I tell you what, I, I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed. And FedEx would never, I had to go down to the office and sign for him. No good. <laughs> Here comes the cum. Yeah. Roman's system is completely confidential and totally discreet. No big logos, nothing on the packages. With Roman, you get a free online evaluation and ongoing care for erectile dysfunction, all from the comfort and the privacy of your home. So you get started as simple. You just go to getroman.com slash IDK and complete the online visit. Take care of your ED without leaving the home completely online. Visit today to connect with a US licensed healthcare professional a professional, and take care of it. Go to getroman.com slash IDK today and get, your prescri um, get you prescribed. Get $15 off your first month of ED treatment. Make sure you're ready to have confidence and control this fall. Roman ready. All right, Larry, you're going to help us go through these questions and tell us where Jim got it wrong. So uh, can you explain to us the difference between a federal prison, state prison, jail? Sure. Uh, obviously, he was wrong on this one because murder is a state crime uh, oh. unless it's done on a federal institution, like a federal land, a federal park. Uh, the Gabby Petito case actually was, I think, a federal park, so that would have been a federal case. Mm. Uh, or, and... With the difference between the feds and the uh, uh, state is it could be any crime. You could they can actually the feds can actually make a crime federal. You could rob a McDonald's. You think what does that have to do with the feds? Well, McDonald's gets its potatoes from Idaho, so now you just interrupted interstate commerce. My crime, jewelry robbery, is not a federal crime, but they got me under the RICO Act. So the RICO is Racketeering Influence Corruption Organization, and they bring, bring me in there because my diamonds were transferred from one state to another. And once you cross state lines, you're interfering with the interstate commerce. It's called the Hobbs Act. And they can make any crime they want federal if the feds want. And if it's a bank, a bank's are, only reason a bank is a, a federal crime is because it's FDIC insured. Uh, if it wasn't FDIC, there are actual banks that are state banks, not federally insured. That is a state crime. That's why you will see people like Jeffrey Dahmer, who murdered, goes to Boston and Massachusetts. And of course, they would have wanted him federally, but it was a, a state crime. And he ended up going to a state prison in Massachusetts, getting killed there, so, so which is, you know, it that's it's, difference. It sounds like the state is where you want to go and the federal is not where you want to go. What difference does it make if it's state or federal crime? What, 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 who cares? Like you're in trouble well, anyway. There's a big difference. Right. <laughs> First of all, the, the wor well, I'll get into the worst prison when we get to that question. Uh, a federal prison, now we're not talking about a check writer or a doctor who doesn't pay his taxes or some bullshit like that. They go to a camp. If we're talking about a federal prison, like I was in United States penitentiaries. Penitentiaries are the worst prisons. I was in a prison. We had a murder a month 
for 18 months. A murder, not counting overdoses, not counting suicide. So that's the difference. Now, the federal prisons have those kind of prisons have the big. They have drug lords, hit men, mobsters, uh, mega mega. Uh, you don't get a guy who robs Seven Eleven. Mm. You don't get a fucking you know a crackhead fucking you know doing a hijacking unless it's on a federal land or something of that nature. So the feds, they try to keep... Now, the federal system is the biggest system in the country, uh, it, by far. It's got 200 and something thousand inmates, and it's, it's a pretty fucked up system. And it, doesn't, and it doesn't matter how much money you have. I was with Nicky Scarfo, who killed 30 people, and a federal judge, and I used to walk the track with him. He was a mob boss in Philly, and he used to say, Larry, I'm going to beat my case. I said, are you fucking crazy? <laughs> fucking guy's got to be crazy. He thinks he's getting out of prison killing a federal judge? This guy you never seen in a day. Like, no, he didn't. <laughs> that he judge didn't. had it in for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, he had it in for me. Killed 30 people and a federal judge. And he used to tell me I was going to beat his case. Not going to happen. So you got a lot more high-profile uh, uh, prisoners. And there's a lot more money in there. But the feds really try to put a tamper on that, but we'll get into that in another question. So this is a little sidetrack. So so coming from Australia, am I right in saying that a lot of the prisons in America are privatized, correct? Well, that's another question you got wrong. Uh, the one thing prison advocates like myself and people who want to fix is we want to stop for-profit prisons, right. private prisons. They're literally for-profit, and they'll come up with how it's cheaper. How can you use your prison model making money and then say, Oh, we don't want any more re- uh, customers coming back in. They were every person that comes into that prison gets a federal dollar. Mm. So they want more prisoners. They could say what they want. The biggest mistake the United States has made is private prisons. And it, it's a, it, they have a couple of them and they have so many problems. Like I could get into it a, a lot. I would have gone for slavery, but let's go with private prisons. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, slavery would have been better in some of the private prisons, you know, and there is slavery in, in prisons. And that's another question that Jim kind of got wrong, but we'll, we'll get into that. Too. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the shoe? Yeah, I, I did not know that. <laughs> the shoe is called, well, there's a, it's the hole. Oh, I know what the, the hole act- is. Everyone knows what the hole is. <laughs> well, the shoe actually acronym is special housing unit. Special housing unit. And I don't know what the fuck is special about it. <laughs> it's it's the whole, it's a prison within a prison. I was in it for three years. I was in it for 11 straight months. And you do fucking go crazy. So that's I mean, solitary I confinement? Think, yeah. That's wow. what you would call another word. Now, solitary now I've confinement. seen it so many times. That doesn't mean you're solo. Sometimes oh. you have a cellmate in there or two. And now try to be in that cell with a person and you're shitting, eating, doing everything in in a box, eight foot by ten foot, and try to live like that for a few months, and you'll start going crazy too. And I, when you see it in movies, there's not even a bed or anything, and there's no TV or anything like that. Is that accurate, or there's there's a bed, right? No, uh, there is a a probably an inch thick mattress, uh, no pillow. It's got a hump on the end of a plastic mat. I actually flushed a mattress down a fucking toilet. If you ever see the, the toilets in prison, <laughs> they have suction. It's a suction. Yeah. And you can act. I actually cut up a mattress and flushed the whole fucking thing down the toilet because I was pretty pissed at them. But the, uh, <laughs> the whole, the whole wait, system. Uh, wait a second. How, how does that get back at that? Now yeah, you don't have a bed. Yeah. I'm going to sleep no, on the floor now. That'll, that'll leave, show you. No, they'll leave three of them in there, which is, they'll, they'll, they'll start crack. They don't give a shit. So you'll go into a new cell and there'll be three of them. You can't even put them anyway. You can't put them on top. If you try to put them on top of each other, you'd be hitting the bunk above you. Or you try to put it away. What the fuck am I going to do with this stupid thing? I said, what's the idea? Too many mattresses. Give you too many mattresses. (laughs) Too much comfort. What's the worst thing about being in the hole? Too many mattresses. (laughs) It's not a mattress and there's no TV. The federal system has no TV. There is no TVs in, in the federal system. And there's no conjugal visits. You know, they, people say, oh, okay, they, you know, you can meet your wife once a month. No, I got, I got put in a hole for jacking off of myself. So, oh, I mean, man. think of that. I mean, yeah, that, and that's actually. That's got to stop lawsuit. you from doing it again. Put you in an isolation <laughs> yeah. room. For fucking yeah, put me in a room alone more. <laughs> no, it, the system is so broke. So fucking broke. Actually, and this is known throughout the world. The United States has the worst prison system in the free world. And what I mean by that is like Australia, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Canada, 
all the, the non-third world countries, the United States has totally, and it's well known, the worst prison system out of all of them. Yeah, I look, I'm always but, very- That's what they should tell you in prisons. It's uh, like, the, forget the rape part. You can't jerk off in yeah. prisons. That would stop yes. people, I think. That would stop us all. <laughs> I'm very hesitant to ever uh, say anything bad about America because whenever I do, I get in trouble. Yeah. People are like, well, fuck you, go back to Australia. But I, I have heard this theory that the prisons are- is it, What was the stat? I think I did in a stat return that 1% of all Americans are incarcerated and like that's like triple that of anywhere else in the free world. Is that stat right, or am I talking out of my ass right now? You, you, you are close. I think it's now at one in one, one, one person of every hundred and twenty right, right. Uh, has either seen time or done time in the United States. So if you took the three hundred million people, whatever that is, but it, it, it's a high number compared to any other country, and we have the worst recidivism rate out of most countries and uh, the worst incarceration rate. So we're not doing a lot of things right in that end. We're really a throwaway country. And we call that put a, put a person in prison and, and throw them away. Now, I'm a rarity because the recidivism is so high. You know, the recidivism in the United States is up to 70% if you leave from the hole. Or it's regular, like 48%, 50%, depending on what, what states and prisons. Now, there is a difference between state and federal prisons obviously and uh, we'll get into that here in a minute did, but did, uh, the, did the reason you don't get back is because you know you had a couple of diamonds that they never found uh, how many no uh <laughs> what diamonds where <laughs> no uh <laughs> listen uh, you know when i went to prison i i saw too many young people coming to prison and i don't give a fuck who they are how badass they think they are they're not when they get there and it, it, you see their lives ruined and i'll give you a quick little a summary how that works you take a kid who's 20 years old and he's got a drug addiction and he goes and robs a bank with a note. You know, he's just going to fucking get money. He's in the attic. He goes to a bank. He goes to a federal prison. They give him four years in prison. Okay, he can do four years in prison. They don't even send him to a MAC. They send him to a medium, a medium, medium prison. And here's this kid gets in there. They don't help his addiction at all. There's more drugs in prison than on the street. People go, what do you mean? I go, if you want heroin to sell on the corner, if you want Coke over there, if you want acid, I did the greatest acid in prison. Oh my God, the best. <laughs> so there's all the drugs you want. I was are right, right by there. a lizard. <laughs> right there. So when you get that kid, he now has an addiction. He goes to prison. And what does he do? He does drugs. So what did the prison do? They put him in the hole for 60 days, they take away his visits for six months. They take away his commissary for six months and they take away his phone privileges for six months. So they never help this kid. He gets out of the hole. What does he do? He needs to do drugs. He needs to connect with people. If he had a connection of somebody on the street that he was calling a construction work uh, owner and he was going to get a job when he got out because he said, I'll give you a second chance. He already loses connection with that kid. Now, if the kid gets out of prison without hepatitis, HIV, which hepatitis is near 40% in prison. Wow. HIV is 20% or something near 20%. Holy shit. So now if you take a kid who goes to prison and he happens to get out, he's either a fucking a psychopath because nobody ever helped his addiction. He's not scared of prison anymore. Before you know it, the kid's still an addict. Now he's going to, you're his next victim. So we really have a broken system in trying to help people and that's just part of why I do what I do, you know, to try to Now, when them. you're talking about the drugs, right? So there's a lot of drugs in prison. Where do they get the money to buy drugs? I've been a poor person who liked drugs, and I used to have to save up for them, and I had a job. So, Well, in prison, you'll have a job, and you'll have to do something. You might be somebody's bitch. You might have to stab somebody. You might have to do whatever it is. You will get credit in prison. And how you pay for that credit, it could be a number of ways in prison. And there's more money in prison. We had one guy in our prison who was making 10000 a month every month as a drug dealer in prison. And there's people who have money. When I went to prison, I had money. There's a lot of mob bosses, people, a lot of people. Have money, and we call it street to street money. So let's say Jim Jeffries is in this prison and he's selling the heroin. Yeah. And Jim said, and, I, and Larry wants the heroin. I say, okay, Jim, give me a thousand dollars worth. I'll send it to the street. I just so want you to I be my bitch, people. Larry. No money for me. I'm not. <laughs> I do. I do just a barter transaction. <laughs> wow, that, that's not good either. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't want to know how I got this heroin to begin with. <laughs> no, oh my that, God. That, you, oh, 
Oh, there's great ways. I mean, you had that wrong, how we get prison dr- drugs in prison besides guards. Uh, obviously, suitcases. Do you know what suitcasing is, Jim? I do not know. No, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to ask. It sounds bad. Rectum. Oh, yes, I've suitcased plenty of things. <laughs> right. I've, I, you know, I open up a lot of my speeches and I say, can anybody here hide a knife up their ass? The place gets quiet. I said, well, I did. I had to get through three metal detectors. A Swiss so army happened, knife, I assume, right? Not like a, not not, like a, not like a crocodile Dundee style knife. No, it was a good shank, about six inches long. You could fit in a toothbrush holder. Oh, you yeah. put it in the top of a toothbrush holder. You, you put masking tape, you insert it in your rectum, you go through the metal detector, of course it goes off, they pull you out of line, strip search, you lift your balls, spread your ass, it's in you, they ain't finding it, and they say get the fuck out of you. They don't know if you have a bullet in you or a, a metal knee or whatever it is. You go to the yard, you squat around your friends, you take it out, you put it in a wooden handle you left on the yard. Mm. People say, well, why don't you just bring the knife, you know, and the whole knife to your yard? No. Because the, the guards are good. If we left the knife on the yard, they take metal detectors and they actually run metal detectors over the whole yard when we're locked in. So if you put a piece of wood, if you ever watch any prison movie, they're always walking on path. So you just put a piece of wood handle right along the path under the grass there. They run metal detectors. It's wood. They're not going to get that. So you squat down like you're tying your shoe. You take that the thing out of your ass. You Then you put it in your shank in your handle, and now you're ready to go. If I didn't do that, I would have been dead because the guards will shoot down on the yard when you're in the middle of a knife fight and everybody lays down flat on the ground. So if you didn't have that, you're going to get stabbed. So you have to do I've been stabbed twice. I stabbed two people, and I've been shot. So I, I understand the, the, the different various uh, items to get killed with. And luckily, I, I never got killed. Of course, uh, I'm here, and I, luckily, I didn't kill anyone because I'd have life in prison. Now. Jack, I got, was, I Jack got was something once better. in a fight where he was pushed over, where a kid like got on all fours behind him, and then another kid <laughs> pushed him, him, and he went backwards. <laughs> that would tell him, tell him the story, Jack. It was that, and it was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I trusted them, which is what hurt the most. Yeah, and that wedgie. Remember, what about the wedgie? A lot no, of I got to tell you, rather, you rather, than first hiding, Sorry, first. rather than hiding a knife up your ass, why don't you guys just not get into a knife fight? That seems like a better better plan. <laughs> well, that sounds really good if you were dealing with really normal people. Yeah. But you're not. You're dealing with, you know, as I used to say, we had 2,000 people in Atlanta. I was in USP Atlanta. USP Atlanta at the time was the worst prison in the United States. Now, well, I'll tell you what it is when we get there. But what has happened is the out of that 2,000 inmates, 880 had life sentences, never getting out. And in the federal system, there's no parole. It is what they call letters. That means you die. You, you will get out. It says life on your jacket. You only way out of there is in a body bag. Now, out of that 880, 200 fight their case legally through the law library every day and stuff, 400 and whatever, 80, get a lover. I've been to a wedding in prison. I mean, they, they'll, 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 the punks will put the blush on them, tattoo their <laughs> lips red, tattoo mascara, oh, tattoo what you're saying they marry, they marry each other. It's not like, because I always see like, so Ted Bundy got married in prison. He had a woman come and visit him all the time. Do you get a lot of letters from chicks who like jewel thieves or what, what happens there? You know, you'd be surprised at how many people uh, actually – they, they stopped a lot of the pen pal stuff because of that uh, in certain prisons because they were getting people getting obviously manipulated and stuff of that nature. But the prisons I'm talking about, wedding is two guys. Yeah, right, right. So they'll actually literally live a life. And then there's other 200 who are psychopaths. I say this all the time. I don't want them getting out of prison and living next to you, my mother, or a relative of mine, because they're psychos. They will fucking kill somebody not give a fuck, kill three people. They're crazy. They're just totally psychopaths. In prison, all they do is look to escape, get dope, and fuck and as much as they can or whatever they're going to do. I'd, I'd actually love to hear a little bit more about your story and just, you know, how you got into well, wait, just, these jewelry heists. Just, just, just oh, oh, this is an off, off topic. I'll do this, right? Okay, so with the diamonds, you stole diamonds. I've been through the problem. I've just gotten married, so I had to buy my first big diamond I've ever purchased. Should have known me. I'd have got you a nice break. <laughs> no, my, my wife didn't want any blood diamonds. I assume your ones have got anal blood all over them. Uh, 
<laughs> but uh, uh, this is the thing about diamonds. Okay, so they last forever. They're going to last for fucking thousands of years. They'll never change. They'll never get a thing. They're the strongest material on earth, right? Yet women always want new ones. What the fuck? Why? Why? Why do you have to have a new one? We, they shouldn't even be going up in value. We should just have the 10,000 we've got now and just they should be moving around people. But it's like, no, I want a new one. <laughs> Last for fucking that, ever. That would be great. You know, I went to the GIA Institute, which is Gemological Institute. I went under the table as a mobster. I paid 10 grand to go to the school so I wouldn't get fucked with diamonds when I'm dealing with the diamonds. So I dealt with so many diamonds. And diamonds are amazing because they do mine them and there are new ones and all that. I, we'll get into diamonds. That's, that's a great topic. So why I robbed diamonds, if you remember on in England, actually, they robbed out of Ritz Carlton, a guy robbed $136 million in a briefcase. Mm. Do you know how much a, that would weigh? You couldn't carry it. Of course, it's thousands of pounds of money if it was actual cash, but you can lift up a bag, literally a briefcase and have $100 million in that briefcase and walk out with it. And the value that usually the turn dollar on a, on a, a guy like myself and in the business I was in, it's about 30 cents on the dollar. So if I robbed a hundred million dollars in diamonds, I'm getting $30 million for that. Now try to rob 30 million in cash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just unrealistic. But so, how did, how did I mean, you, how did you get into the diamond game? Like I assume, and I, correct me if I'm wrong. I assume you did petty crimes before then, or did you do robberies before that? And then you found diamonds or was it straight into diamonds? Well, no, no, I, I did a lot of different things before that. Uh, I, I was a collector. I used to uh, muscle a card game for the mob. I was growing up with those guys in Brooklyn, New York, and I learned the bookmaking business first. Then we were, I was sent to Florida, and my first robbery of jewelry diamonds was a setup. It was the owner who wanted his rob to get the insurance money oh, on his diamonds, oh, wow. and I got the diamonds. He got his insurance money where everybody was happy. That was my first robbery, and I said, wait a minute, this is too good. But no, I robbed warehouses, and when I used to rob anything that was valuable, I used to rob uh, wedding dresses. People go, what do you mean? I went to rob, uh, I had $75,000 in wedding dresses. They were 300 bucks a wedding dress, whopped the whole fucking store out, put it in a ride or rent the truck, and drove it fucking from Florida to New York. Nice hit. Robbed a, war a warehouse, a plumbing supply warehouse. I assume you had to get rid of them in Jersey, right? The wedding dresses. Yeah, yeah. I could no, New York. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like, how did you sell the wedding dresses on? You just sell them to one supply or you just put an ad on Craigslist, like got wedding no, dresses? No, no, no. <laughs> in, in, in my business, we had connections with everybody. We, you know, you, it was a one stop shop. You go to one guy, boom, he's your fan. And you tell them what you got. I robbed a, a whole warehouse, a Ferguson uh, Enterprises warehouse, the plumbing warehouse jacuzzis, gold faucets, toilets, you name the fucking thing. The guy owed us money and he was the warehouse manager. So we ended up going in on a Sunday when they were closed, wipe the, not wipe. They didn't even know they were robbed. The warehouse was so big. The warehouse <laughs> was the fucking size of a football field. So we took forklifts, put everything in a truck, got to New York, one guy, one contract. I want the whole truck. I'll give you a hundred grand. Done. Okay. Goodbye. Right. The guy owed me three grand. What, what, what a score. So it's how you, how you maneuver. It's all about the fence. And, you know, I, I owned a, a security guard company. And a guy come, <laughs> one of the guys who works for me comes to me, Larry, says, I could get all these Rembrandts. I could get all these Picassos, all these, these big high dollar pictures. He goes, you want them? He was a security there. I said, let me check it out. It was a whole weekend thing in the convention center in Miami. And I says, hold on. I, I made a lot of phone calls. I couldn't get two cents on the dollar. Jeez. So the heat wouldn't have been worth it. If you take a Rembrandt worth a million dollars, I can't get 20 grand for it. What the fuck am I going to rob that thing for? It's all about, I, I hate to say how you teach kids. I don't. I teach them <laughs> that it's not worth it. But you got to have an out before you rob anything. Yeah. Don't rob something just to be a fucking kleptomaniac. You know, rob something because you're going to get value for it. I mean, Whatever you do. Now, I, I'm not giving tips on yeah, people. Yeah, i, I, I got to be honest, Larry. You, you sound like you miss it a bit, mate. <laughs> <laughs> now, how, did you, how did you get caught? Uh, I love this one. Everybody <laughs> talks about how, oh, they're fucking idiots. The FBI is the smartest motherfuckers in the world. 
I was never worried about local police, state police, fucking city and town. They don't have the money. You know, if the FBI wants to bring a witness, they'll send them on a fucking F-16 from fucking Florida to California. They don't give a fuck. The feds have all the money. And when that agent that wants you dies, there's somebody to fill his fucking place. And that's it. The guy who caught me was a guy named Matt Mullen from uh, a major case squad, Quantico, Virginia. And, and he was the best there. He retired. He said, like, I'm retiring. Because I was looking for you for six years. I knew your MO, but I didn't know who you were. I got caught by the FBI. Actually, I did not know this at the time. When I did a robbery, the FBI would flood an area with 20 agents. They confiscated every camera from a mile or two from that store. So they actually had me in Savannah, Georgia, going to buy a cup of coffee at a Wawa store. And they placed me in the area at that time because they had all the videos from all the stores around the area. The feds can do a lot of things the state can't do, or and they can put it together better. So anybody who says, ah, I'll beat the feds, that's the FBI, you idiots. Well, I bet he's saying that either after getting out of prison or he's still in fucking prison. Yeah, see, that's, <laughs> because they're not stupid. That's the thing is I watched like that Ted Bundy documentary, and it just seemed to me the way he got away with it is just by driving to another town. Seemed to be like, oh, we can't crack this case. He went to a different town. And they don't have the same records as this town. And so as soon as they cross borders, I assume now with the internet, that's not the case that they're all linked up. But like the FBI was always linked up, obviously. No, Jim, you're wrong. Even today, you know, if you do, so, if I did a robbery right here in Palm Bay, Florida, mm. depending on the size of them, of course, I mean, obviously, it's the, you know, well, this area I live in, I still have the high, the biggest robbery ever that was in this area. But the, the, no, you, you could rob something in Florida. And California is not going to know about it. I mean, unless it's it's an international crime or it's some big enough crime. You rob a fucking 7-Eleven in fucking in in Miami. You're not California's not going to know about that unless you left fingerprints and they all put it in the national database or something of that nature. But they're not going to link up a motive or a a, a a pattern that's going on. They don't have that resources to go give it to every other. Do you think some fucking ho dunk fucking town in Kentucky gives a fuck about Larry Lawton that robbed something in fucking wedding dresses in fucking Fort right, Lauderdale, right, Florida? Right, right. But what about a mur- what about a murder right. though? A murder? Well, murders again, depending on what evidence and stuff they have now, national databases. But again, linking a murder, there's so many murders. We had. I live in a little Brevard County, Florida, here in Central Florida. And I think we had uh, we have already uh, ten murders in this little county. So I mean, there's there's murders that they're going to solve and stuff. Just nobody knows, and unless they leave fingerprints or DNA evidence and stuff that gets into a database, even that they prove with rapes. It's such a shit. They have like ten year backlog on a rape yes. uh, a DNA yeah. uh, for for somebody. So that that's I don't think it's I, I just think it's a lack of manpower. And I think it's a lack of uh, them trying to figure out uh, what they want to do. You got to remember some guy who works in some town, he's working here 20 years, makes detective after 17 years. He's got three fucking years or five years to retirement, whatever the hell it is. How much is he giving a fuck about this thing? You know, his next one comes, he goes, of course, high profile, a whole different animal. Right. So with, with the fingerprints, obviously your fingerprints are on every database across the fucking world, Larry. We can all assume this. <laughs> Right, Even in Australia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There'd be fingerprints on diamonds that will last forever. But uh, every time you're in a bank or something like that and you touch like a pen or something like that or the counter and then like you, you must leave going, I hope there's not a robbery in there. They'll fucking blame me. <laughs> you, you know, that is a funny question because, you know, there was a big robbery, a jewelry robbery. And I don't know how many people who know me said, hey, Larry, you did the FBI, are they looking at you? <laughs> you did it or whatever. I can guarantee they, they do know where the, the major players who did something like that are or and they would look for something like that. And you're right, my da- my DNA and everything is in the federal system and, and all the systems are on. Have you ever got yourself a 2020 about you or any uh, TV documentary about your crimes? I watch a lot of oh, those. I just did many of them. Uh, a Vice TV did one. Uh, our Huckabee show, zillion of them. I, uh, th- you can just Google my name and you'll see a bunch of them. Who was who was the jewel about. thieves in Florida that they got away on water bikes, water scooters? Ooh, that was one uh, I watched. I don't know those. I knew the guys that they had the biggest one down here. That was they had a guy named Murph the Surf. He just passed away. Ah, oh, God he, bless he, him. He, he died. Oh, he died the star of India. He robbed. 
But I used to fuck with him, you know. I knew him when he was an old guy, and I said, "Listen, you robbed that, but that was only five million. I fuck, I robbed eighteen million. <laughs> I said, you got to get up the up the game a little bit. You don't, but you, no, don't it, you, don't, it, you don't have to tell on anybody. But have you got any mates who have just gotten away with it forever? They've never gotten caught. Oh, absolutely. Matter <laughs> of fact, uh, you know, it's in my case, I'm the only one who went away. I just forgot. I don't know who to name. Some guy named John Rodriguez was my partner. And I have no idea who he is, where he is. I don't know how many John Rodriguez are in Miami, but anyway, who knows where he is. All right. Let's but go. nobody got arrested on my case. I went away on what they call a RICO alone. And RICO, you're supposed to have more, more co-defendants and everything else. But I went away on a RICO act because I had what they call unindicted co-defendants. Now, what happens also is I knew guys in the 80s when I was getting, now I'm 60 years old now. And back in the 80s and, and uh, late 80s, mid 80s, and into the 90s, you know, Miami was the biggest drug dealer. I had a great friend of mine who was a big, big drug dealer. He got out, and now he owns, I don't know, a ton of, ton of auto parts stores and stuff. Legit, doesn't touch anything, doesn't go near anything. Took his money, he got out, he was smart. You know, they, the FBI asked me, they said, man, Larry, you're the best we ever see do it. You had power, you had homes, boats, horses. You know, you had your own limousine driver. Why didn't you get the fuck out? I said, you know, it wasn't the money. It was winning and it was the power that, that brought that, it, you know, it's, it's a different mindset. I think, of course, what, you'd say, what, like, are, what are the women that. like, are there women who go after the organized crime people in the movies? They always seem to have nice looking birds. Well, you know, it was funny because we had so much Coke. We had every broad in the world. So right, that'll easy. get them. That are women like that'll the cocaine. Get them, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> open up legs, just put a little bit of white somewhere in you. All right. But the, uh, <laughs> in my limousine, I had a glass mirror with two bevels on it and the, the gold straw. And you just take the, you know, an ounce of Coke, go it across. You got two perfect lines. Boom, boom. Bring it back. Two perfect lines. I mean, it was just, you, you can get anything you want. I mean, obviously it's, it's right. one of those. I, I don't listen. I did a lot of drugs. I did every drug in the book. Yeah. I was never an addict. And people say, what do you mean? I said, I never, I quit. I could stop. I do that drill today to people. I tell you guys, no matter what your vice is, you got to quit it for three weeks. I do this test with myself at 60 years old. I might stop drinking for three weeks and people, people just, I don't tell people I'm doing anything. I go out with my buddies and stuff and I'll, I'll order a ginger ale and nobody says anything, but I do it for myself just to show myself. I still can control it and not let it control me. No matter what that is, so it could be gambling, it could be drugs, it could be women, it could be any. You control it. Don't let it control you, and, and you, you'll be a lot better off for it. You'll uh, live a better life. So how, do, how, do, how does bail work? How does bail work? Yeah, let's ask that question. Well, yeah, bail, first of all, Jim, yeah. Yeah. you do get bail back unless you go to a bail bondsman. A bail bondsman, you have to give 10% of that bail. So if you have a, a let's just say you have a $100,000 bail, you could put up ten grand. He puts up the whole bond with the, the, the state. Now, if you jump bail, that man is, is responsible for that extra 90, well, for the whole 100,000. And if not, if you show up, he keeps the 10. Now, if you want to put up bail yourself, you get every cent of that back. Right. You actually can put up property. Sometimes they'll call bail and they'll say property or cash bail. That means you have to put up cash. I believe Everybody in this world, I think every drug dealer, every big drug dealer should have a bail. Give him a bail of 20 million cash. Let him fucking jump. So what? He fucking goes back to Columbia. You don't see the motherfucker again. And the government just got 20 million. Doesn't have to pay another 30,000 a year to house this guy for the next life, for the rest of his life. And you make money. And if you catch him again, give him another 30, $30 million bond. Right, right, right. You know, then he's going to fucking pay his bail and he's going to go out. And it's another 30 million. How does the government make fifty million real quick? Let one guy out. Right. But that's that's a serious thing. Bail. A lot of states now, like New York, has wiped out bail because it, it was so against poor people. Because it, it was just you know supporting people who have money. And they were giving people bail. I was in a, a county jail. I told one guy, I'll "Bail you out if you shut your fucking mouth. You fucking bother me." <laughs> so, uh, his bail was one hundred and seventy-five dollars. He couldn't put up twenty-five dollars. I said, shut your fucking mouth. When I get out of here, I have my guy put up on 75 hours. <laughs> so he shut his mouth. But every time he opened his mouth, he said, shut up. If you open your fucking mouth, 
You ain't getting out. It was, <laughs> it, it's crazy because just that a little amount of money kept that person in a county jail. Yeah. Yeah. Now, but also th- that amount of money, like obviously if they're out and they haven't got $25, how are they going to make money without crime? So I, uh, you know, it, it feels like at least they're getting three meals or is that very insensitive of me to say that? Well, that, 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 that's not even the truth. I think it, it made this for the, uh, more for a, a homeless person who does want shelter for that time and they know the system so well, but there are other places, but there's nobody who gets out of prison and says, you know what? I think I'm going back. You know, you'll hear people say, man, I'll kill a cop before I go back. And that's sad as it is, but you'll hear them say that. So no, that's not true. Uh, Oh, you know, they want to go back. Nobody wants to go back. What happens is people have a memory. We're blessed as human beings. We are blessed to have the ability to, put things that were bad to us in the past. Take me, I was abused as a kid. I was able to put that aside to live a, a productive life and not judge certain things and whatever it is. But you, 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 what happens with like people who commit crimes is they'll commit a crime, they'll go to jail, they'll hate the fucking jail. Who likes to be told what to do, when to do, watch your ass, watch people get killed, the food, sh- everything's bad. I've been married for a year. I'm sure it gets worse, right? (laughs) Oh, then you get married, (laughs) you know. (laughs) But there's no way in that whole system that uh, we shouldn't help people try to stay out of prison. Because if we if we don't keep keep trying to stay out of prison, they're gonna go back, and they're gonna only go back. I own horses, Jim, and it's funny because I I I had these two horses, beautiful horses. One used to try to knock me off. They had to put a tie down on its chin. And so a cowboy comes up to me and says, hey, Larry, do you want the, the horse to stop that? I said, sure. Gets on the horse. He takes a beer bottle. He fills it with warm water, gets on the horse. The horse does this. Bam! He fucking slams it. If you, if you ever know the top of a horse's head is like a fucking brick, right. you're not hurting it. But the water, the warm water went over the horse. He thought it was his own blood. His hoofs went out. He never lifted his fucking head again because he will never forget that. We're lucky as human beings to put some of the shit that's happened to us into a place that we can forget about. The problem is that shit that happens to you in prison, these people put put behind them again and they forget about it until they're arrested because they did something fucking stupid. When, when you got when you got someone leaving the prison, let's let's call him you know, Jimmy the Knife, right? And he's fucking leaving, and you know Jimmy's coming back. Do you and the other prisoners have a little bit of a gamble on how long it will take for him to come back? Great story. I had a celly. It, it was a serial bank robber. And he comes up to me one day. And he goes, Larry, he goes, I'll pay you. I go, what the fuck are you talking about? Goes, I owe you $100. I'm going to pay you. I swear. I go, what the fuck are you talking about? He goes, I just want an appeal. They told me to go to R&D, which is receiving a discharge. I'm getting out. He's fucking crazy. He starts packing fucking laundry detergent. I go, what the fuck are you doing? Get your legal work. Get the fuck out of here. He goes, no. He goes, Maybe my mother doesn't have a, a laundry detergent. I said, this guy's fucking nuts. So he leaves. We all got around. We said, I'll bet he's back in six months. In about four months, the fucker was back. Right. Four months. That means he went through the system, got convicted, he actually violated his probate, uh, parole and all that kind of stuff. Then he comes walking into prison with a big smile on his face. What a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> That's a break of a lifetime. And he fucking does it. But it, it's a shame. Because some people have zero education, and that's a big downfall too. But you know, that all they know is the street hustle, and whatever that hustle is, is I, most likely illegal. I, I just I, I, I've told this story in many different. No, no, no stories. We got to get to the questions. No, Jim. no, it's a, it's a prison one. It's a prison uh, thing. Yeah. Uh, all right. <laughs> We have a lot of questions you got wrong to get to. Enough stories. Enough stories already. He, he's remote, but he's still doing his job. Jesus. Yeah, that, that COVID makes you grumpy, yeah? He's wrong. You do good in prison. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, you gotta I'm kill, a charge you here. you got to kill time, man. Um, Wait, go, how, how does bail work? Uh, Jim said bail's an amount of money assigned. We, 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 by, just, did we just did bail. Oh, shit, sorry. Hey, Kelly. I, that's, not, that's not what I meant. No, you know what first <laughs> getting on to you? So, <laughs> I meant what happens during booking? Uh, Jim says you give him your watch, all your stuff, the orange jumpsuit, and then you get it all back when class is over. Uh, well, not class, but he's pretty right on that one. All it is is process. Booking is where they take your picture, they do this, they, 
and you're in a county jail when you're booked or in the feds, it can be in a federal detention center. It doesn't matter, but he is correct. You get in there, you give your property. In fact, the FBI, when they arrested me and they had the helicopters over the house, the whole work, the FBI was pretty good. The guy goes, he, and I knew the drill already. So I had great sneakers and I had about three grand in my pocket, you know, watch, go well, you know, nice, beautiful. I, I just gave it all to my wife at that time and they didn't care. And then I went and got processed. I went booked. I had to put my property in, do this pretty much, depending on what jail you're in, you don't get an orange jumpsuit in the feds. You do. You actually get an orange jumpsuit. He was right on at that. But in some places, they even have still street clothes. I mean, if it's a county jail in Miami. So you want to fill your pockets with as much shit as possible? No, opposite. As least as you can. Because what what you put in there, first of all, if you go as long as I did, it's going to be outdated when you get out. (laughs) Uh, Number one. Or number two, it's Sometimes it comes up missing. I mean, if you, if you walked in there with 3,000 cash, I'm sure it's going to say, oh, you only put 1,000 cash in there. Yeah, right. I mean, it's just human nature there. You want as least as you can uh, going in, not as much. So why are inmates generally transferred, Jim said, for overcrowding, safety, causing too many fights, uh, petition to move so they could be closer to their family? He was close. Uh, yes, or most of them not for petitioning. You don't petition. Say, you know, I'd like to go to that prison right there. It's a nice prison. That doesn't work. You don't have a fucking choice. In fact, when I got transferred, I was telling you I was on Con Air 16 times. I kept getting transferred farther away from the from my home. And even in the federal system, it says they're supposed to keep you within 500 miles. And I was 1,000 miles. I was living in Florida at the time, and I would get transferred all the way to Yazoo, Mississippi, and then Forest City, Arkansas, so they, they wanted me, and that's because I was a troublemaker. So Jim is right about that. If you're a troublemaker or you're a, a fighter, I was get I got into a lot of altercations and stuff of that. I, I assaulted a staff member and stuff of that nature, and you're going to get transferred right away. Uh, so he is right about that. You could be a, a, a headache or a, a unruly pen or even protective custody people. If you go to a prison and, and you what they call check-in, that means you go to prison and, and you're scared of the prison. Somebody says they're going to kill you. And you go, oh, I, want to, I don't want to be in this prison. And they'll stick you in the hole for a year and then transfer you. Right. So that's what they'll do. So, so he was okay. close. When you said you, you spent, uh, you had four 12-year sentences, that means you served 48? You, you're too young no. for that. Well, they, no, they're no, all no. at once. I can say. Right. They, they, there's two ways they do it. They call, they call it running wild or con, uh, concurrently. concurrently. Concurrently, if they do yeah. 12. You know, a lot of people ask that same question, Jim, and they go, why do you give a guy three life sentences? You can't fucking die three times. Here's why. If I beat one of my cases in one court, I still got to do my time because mm. I got 12 more. I got 12 years, four times in mm. four different federal districts. If you got three life sentences and you beat one on an appeal, something happened, they fucked up the evidence. You're still going to do life because you still got two more life sentences. So a lot of people don't understand how, and if they say it's running wild, I, the only reason I'm out of prison, I, I was facing life and I beat a gun charge. If I don't beat the gun charge, I never get out of prison because they have to run wild or consecutive. Right. And in the federal system, the first robbery you commit with a gun, it's five years on top of whatever you get. Every robbery after that, you get 20 years running wild. Mm. So I would have got 40 years just for the gun. Right. Just for the gun. Uh, not 40. I would have got 80, uh, 20, 20, 20, and 5. I would have got 65 years just for the gun and another 10. I would have got 85. So I assume uh, Jim was correct about Con Air. He said when they're shipping federal prisoners, it's a prison plane with terrible food, no TV, shitty Wi-Fi. Well, great, no Wi-Fi, uh, <laughs> food, no food. Uh, they give you an, an apple, a bag. They, it was so funny. I was doing a video on that. They, 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 you know, shackle you. And every time I was on Con Air, they give you crackers that are fucking outdated. So I guess stores that, that can't sell fucking, you know, peanut butter cracker. Right. Every time they were outdated. So they must donate them to the fucking federal government. And they give them to inmates because no food is fucking up to date. And it's funny because I used to tell kids, you know, I was, I was in the system for a while. So young kids that come in and they process you to go on on air 
at one in the morning, they start processing you before the federal marshals come and get you and bring you on a bus to a plane. They surround the plane with fucking agents and shotguns. And you're sitting there. And I used to tell the kid, I said, hey, kid, don't eat that. And they go, what do you mean, man? Oh, gee, you don't want to eat that? It's some bullshit fucking piece of bologna on fucking bread. I mean, garbage. Fucking, you talk yellow, green bologna. That's all true. So I said, don't eat that, kid. And he's, oh, man, oh, gee, man, you don't want to eat that. I want to eat that. Okay. I watched the fucking kid. You might be on Con Air for 13 hours. You can't stand, you can't move, you, you're in fucking shackles and fucking leg irons, and now you're on that plane for 13 hours and you got to shit. Guess what? They don't let you take those shackles and shit off. You fucking, you, you, you can pee. You can fucking, still, you know, you, hey, I got to pee. You'll stand and pee and just fucking pee all over the fucking place because you're fucking in shackles and fucking. Oh, no, no, I've, you know, I've, I've been on Southwest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Oh, yeah, that, that, that's a cattle car. I, I said everybody might as well go on Con Air. You're going to go fucking Southwest. <laughs> uh, where's the most dangerous prison in the country? Jim said San Quentin. No, uh, if you even look it up, Google, it's going to be ADX Colorado. ADX is the most secure and worst prison in the country. Is that because of the Andy altitude? Unabama, Kaczynski. So what? Is that because of the altitude? It takes a while to get accustomed to being yeah. there. Yeah, you don't get outside. I don't know what fucking out. You're fucking under a mountain. It's in, in, in a mountain, actually. Do the penis is going yeah. further into your ass at that altitude. Wow, like home, like really home runs. Far. <laughs> and, and what they do is they hire the guys with the biggest cock. So now you're really fucked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what is helicopter wire? Uh, Jim said it's something you choke somebody with. I don't uh, think he was right on that. That's, the sound, that's the sound you make when you get choked. <laughs> yeah. In, in, in prisons, in maximum security prisons, they actually put helicopter wire over the yard. So a person can't land a helicopter to try to escape. Oh. So they have wire through a matter of fact, I, I was just talking about that. I used to sit on the East yard and land and say, man, I know I can get out of here. And they had helicopter wire. But I used to say, if a guy hovered over there, dropped the wire. And I was there at six in the morning during when the yard opened, I could jump on that wire. The guy could take me up. If they shoot you out of the tower, I don't know if they even would do that. They don't know if the helicopter has been hijacked. And I assume but that's because those prisons have it. lots of money in them. It's the mob bosses and people who could afford a helicopter exactly. to come pick them up. You got drug kingpins. You got an El Chapo. You got a did you ever Nick see, Arena, did, Nicky Scarfo, uh, all the guys. Did you, you ever mamba. see an escape or did you escape at any stage yourself? No, I never escaped. Yes, I did. Uh, matter of fact, it, it, Woody Harrelson's father, oh. Charles Harrelson, killed the federal judge too. He was in federal prison. He was in Atlanta. He was escaping when they caught him on the wall. Now, you got to remember, Atlanta had 40-foot walls, 40-foot walls, 20 feet underground, 3-foot thick. In fact, in 1903, it was the most poured concrete ever in, in the United States at that time. And it's around the whole fucking complex with, with gun tower and the whole works. And he tried to escape there. I also watched another guy try to escape by a group that came in and he got all the clothes right and he he planned this out and he tried to walk out with the fucking crew and he got caught right at the last minute. Uh, but there have been people, men. Now, if you're talking about small, low, like there's a, if you're in a camp, a federal prison camp, you can walk away from that camp, literally walk away. Mm. They, they, there's not enough guard. There, you, there's no fence. You can literally walk, but they threaten them. Like those guys, are like, you know, like I said, bankers or people like that. If you fucking try to escape from a, a camp, you will get an escape charge. And then you will go to a prison like I was in. Right. And those guys oh, yeah, do yeah. not want to go to a prison like that because it wouldn't be pretty. Now, do you, do you, when you said you work with children, do you do that like scared straight stuff where you take kids into the prison and people come and go, I'm going to be your bitch and all that type of stuff. I always feel when I watch those shows, the prisoners are having fun. It, yeah. it, it, it breaks up their day. They've had a long week. They've just been in the hole. They've been eating their fucking sale crackers. Their acting reels and they're incredible. Like, they're like, am I get, what, I get to yell at a 13-year-old who smoked pot? Uh, that'll well, be a well, good day. Know, Jim, it's a great question. And no, first of all, it's been proven many times scared straight doesn't work. If I yelled at you, you have two reactions, either fight or flight. If you don't think you can beat me, you're looking to get out of the situation. So they don't see you. They don't even hear you. They're just, they put up a block. It's proven many years since the seventies. If I told you the story that I was in Atlanta when this kid got his ass cut from the top of his anus until his 
scrotum with a razor blade mm. and two guys raped him and they found seminal fluid. You, I, I get kids that come up to me years later and say, Mr. Law, and I, I'll never forget that story about the kid who. Oh, stop, 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 stop. We just, we just, just cut out. I pay this money for audio people. <laughs> What did you say? There we go. There it, we go. No, just cut out. You, for you, some there reason, was, there the was, sound cut out again. There was a boy whose ass was cut with a razor blade. Someone <laughs> came up to you and said, I never forgot that story because it helps me masturbate. And then <laughs> go, go, go from that point there. Love this fucking humor. You, you would make it in prison, Jim. Oh, would I? I just think with your comedy, you'd make it because everybody needs to fucking laugh. I think it's because of my fucking horrendous hemorrhoids that people would go to rape me and they'd go, no, thank you. <laughs> and, then, and then like, now I, I, I get somebody in my like that. I know, I know me, my feelings would be hurt. I'd be like, why? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me my uh, asshole's it, pretty. Scared straight doesn't work. I don't believe in it. A lot of people don't believe in it. There was this. I think if you tell certain stories, they, they have a lot more impact than, fuck you, you stupid ass motherfucker. What are you doing? Get the fuck out of here. Who is the fucking jerk off? Is, is, no. is this real, the old, uh, that they used to put like a bit of PVC piping up your ass and they put the barbed wire up your ass and they pull the PVC piping out so your asshole clenches around the barbed wire? Is that true or is that just a fun story? <laughs> Well, I think that's a really good story, but I want to hear the whole story. Like, how does he eventually get it out? Oh, they then they rip the barbed wire out. It's like really oh, fun no. anal beads. <laughs> wow, that's really fun anal beads. You know, no, nobody minds a butt plug, but that's a little bit different. See? <laughs> I just uh, there's a lot of ass work going yeah, on in yeah, prison. Definitely. That's what I've picked up. Uh, we got a couple but, more. What it was? What's a stand up guy? Uh, Jim said guy who's in the mafia or repped by the mafia. And uh, alternatively, what's a rat in comparison? Oh, we all know what a okay, rat is. A rat's good, a person who talks. Very good question. Stand up guy does not have to be in the mafia. He does not have to be in the mafia. He does not have. To, he has to be a guy who's a. See, there's two types of people. There's, a, there's an inmate and a convict. Convicts are people who are. Uh, the words stand up. They're going to fight the system. They're going to not going to rat. They're not going to uh, do something with the guard. That's, they're going to try to manipulate the guard. They're not going to try to fucking tell on anybody or anything. A rat. Is, first of all, the two lowest people in prison are rats and chomo. Chomo is a child molester. Mm. So oh. when, when I they thought you were saying something racist out, there. <laughs> I used to pull their paperwork. I mean, I watched one guy get a fucking buffer machine dropped on his fucking head from the top tier. And if you ever seen those big industrial buffer machines, yeah, well. the floors fucking dropped from the tier and his whole fucking head went down. So that, that's not a good thing. Chomos and rats are not good. Stand up guys does not have to be in the mob. He has to, he could be any, he could be a bank robber, he could be a, a jewel robber, he could be anything that's a stand up guy. Now, the crimes they commit also are very important. Crimes against kids are not not great at all in prison because most of us in prison have kids. Yeah, or had you know we have kids and we think about that this fucking jerk off one after this fucking twelve year old and there's certain fucking crimes uh, that are even against the the elderly. They're not a respect. I, I imagine drum. also you said yourself. I imagine a lot of the prisoners have had crimes uh, committed against them when they were children. So that would probably add to the anger. A absolutely, and, and you'd be surprised how we'd sit there. And why to say, I hope this motherfucker comes to our prison. Because if he did, he wouldn't be treated well. And just take a look at Whitey Bulger. Everybody knows who he is, the mob guy from fucking yeah. Boston. Found him he in Santa rat. Monica. Well, he, yeah, exactly. And that man went to prison. He went to Hazleton. He was in Hazleton one day. And they fucking killed him and got his eye out with a fucking shank. They were trying to cut his fucking tongue out. They killed him right there within, I think it was three hours and he hit the yard. Jeez. Mm. So he didn't make it. And that was a federal prison, the USP. See, there's a difference. A lot of people say, oh, I'd rather be in the feds than the state. They've never been in them. They've never been mm -hmm. in both. Mm -hmm. You're talking a maximum security prison. Jim was right on this. The feds are worse when it comes to maximum security prison. Of course, there's more money and more dangerous people. And most people have serious time. I had four 12-year cents and I would shut my fucking mouth. Cause that's like nothing there, you know. Right, it's right, like right. fuck, you know. Oh man, oh, he only got fucking twelve. Fuck him. Yeah, you think your life's over? I went to prison at thirty-four years old. I got out at forty-six years old. Right. And you think, oh, you know, you do lose the best years of your life, your kids, your everything. You know, that's why I do what I do. I had a thirteen, fifteen-month-old daughter. I got out. She was thirteen. My son was six. I got out, and he was eighteen. Yeah, that's right. I'm very close with him. My son works for me, but and my daughter, I wish she would, you know, but. They're, they're learning and it's 
So people have kids, people care about kids and elderly people have a mother home or something like that. But if you're a stand up guy, you are a bank robber, a drug dealer, or a, you know, a murderer, but I know it sounds crazy. I always say that. Oh, he was a nice guy. He's a fight. He killed the guy with an axe. Head on a <laughs> and, uh, they, were there ever guards that you liked or were they always the enemy? No matter of fact, I, on my YouTube channel, Jim, I, I, I interview a guard who actually, I make prison pasta and his daughter sees it and says, dad, there's a guy that makes that pasta you make. The guard sees the video and goes, that's the guy who taught me how to make it. That's Larry Lawton. I, he was my guard. Right. Since then, we, not only are we friends, he comes on my YouTube. He ended up going to prison for a year for smuggling. He smuggled uh, cigarettes and uh, now he was the head of a union. I learned he's got, I got good videos of him and I. His name is Gary Massey. Nice guy. And to this day, there were good guards, Jim. There were guards there that we would protect. There was a guard in Atlanta when they, when the, here's the story, the Cubans took over Atlanta for seven days, 10 days, seven or 10 days. They literally took over the whole fucking prison and they raped this one guard and his wife right in front of each other. They raped Jesus them both. They hated Christ. them. Mm. But there was this one guy I worked for, a guy named Perry. They actually protected him because that dude was good to them. And he used to give a class to the new guards and say, listen, you treat these people like, they, like, like your father, a person of family with respect. He goes, because they'll never forget. This one guard fucks with you. He forgot about it. You think that prisoner is ever going to forget? And when yeah. the time changes, that fuck is the target. Right. So he used to actually give a class to guards on how to treat people in prison. So Speaking I, of the- I, I have to ask quickly, prison pasta, I assume it's the yeah. same as normal pasta, but the sauce is made with anal blood? <laughs> it's made in the toilet. <laughs> Another wrong one. But it, believe it or not, it's fucking pasta. I just did a, pri- a, a prison cooking video today and I'm fucking, I'm stuffed because I'm fucking, well, I'm 250 pounds. I like to eat. Mm. But the, uh, it, it was made with different things, cut up garlic, stuff we steal out of the kitchen, pasta, oil, garlic, and with a stinger, you take two drain covers and you put a little piece of wood between them and I could boil water quicker with that than I can with a stove oh, into wow. a bucket. Mm. And, and you'd make, you know, you'd make your own product. I actually did that video Literally like I did it in prison. And the guard himself, daughter, says, Daddy, that's not prison. That's what you did. And he goes, I don't think he made it with a fucking stinger. But <laughs> <laughs> he called it prison. It's called a stinger. It's the thing that you boil water with. Right. Since we were talking about the guard uh, that got arrested for smuggling, I know we touched on the drugs, but ha- is that how the majority of drugs are getting into the prisons? Is smuggling through guards? Or how, how is it getting in and there? And what are the quality of the drugs more uh, as well? Actually, Jim, the quality of drugs is very good. Uh, but now drugs come in two different ways. Obviously, they come in through guards and big numbers and stuff. But I'll tell you a quick way in prison, like you go to a vending machine. Let's say you visited me, Kelly, and you, you knew that the vending machine had m and uh-huh. You would actually go to a store, buy a bag of M&Ms, open it really carefully, put balls of, of heroin in like condoms, really small. Feel it with, with glue and everything because they'll check you when you come in. It's glue. They know you could feel it do anything. You'd go to the vending machine. I come out to visit you. I can't, I can't do it. We can hug one. We sit. You give me a bag of chips. I'm drinking water. I'm literally drinking the, uh, the balls and it would go through my system and I'd get back to the unit and shit it out and I'd be the king of the prison. Now, I never did that. Mm. But anyway, that's how it's done. <laughs> a lot of time, or a girl would meet you and literally have a cotex. And the cotex would be full of heroin, you know, in cellophane, in the cotex. Yeah. And she'd hug you and, and slip her hand down your butt and stick it up your ass because they had to do that. Because when a prisoner goes for a visit, they get strip search going out to the visit and then they get strip search coming back. Now, if it's up your ass, they ain't going to find it, obviously. How do they so not see somebody hugging and somebody else shoving and, something and up their also, ass? No, a- you could listen. You knew where the cameras were. You know what I gave you, you know what I gave you a hug it. when I came in today, Kelly. Yeah, but check yourself when you get home. But I think a lot of people saw that. <laughs> <laughs> I filmed it. Also, also, Listen, if they think if they, about this, if you stood up, Kelly, and you hugged Jim right now, 
away from the cameras at. You can literally stick your hand right down his pants and nobody would fucking All know. All right, let's try, it, Jim. Back, let's try it, Jim. One, <laughs> two, three. But, but also, also, they strip search you on the way in. They strip search you on the way out. There must be visitors where you're like, oh, it's me uncle Dave. I can't be fucking asked with this. I have this. to show my balls for Dave yeah, again? Yeah, God. <laughs> If it's me, if it's me kids, I'll do it. But I don't know. I, uh, how, how you been, Dave? All right. Yeah, they do it quick. We, uh, but no. The, uh, they, the, actually, the guards that do that are so used to it. I mean, obviously, they get complacent and you're in and out and yeah. stuff. A lot of stuff is passed through a visiting room. But they try to get it. And, and again, there's not enough eyes for that many. Inmates are very uh, creative. We'll block for each other. Like uh, we we knew where the guard station was, where a camera was. You'd pop while another guy gets a fucking behind the vending machine and gets a quick piece of ass, you know, by his girlfriend or whatever it is. And I know guys who got his wife pregnant by doing that. I guess so, at the end of the I mean, day, being a guard is just a job, and everybody tries to half-ass their job. So what? <laughs> not only that, Kelly, they don't get paid worth the shit. Right. And, uh, and well, are they going to put their lives on the line for the shit? You know. Yeah. Some of them point. actually are pretty good, like Jim said, and they actually feel bad for you. They'll start out by just trying to help you out and doing something nice. Before you know it, they're fucking bringing in something they don't even know. We had a guard bringing stuff in. He thought he was bringing in only weed, but inside the packed weed was heroin. Right. Because heroin is very rampant in prison. Right. Mm. So he would do that. Now, are there any movies, in your opinion, that show an accurate portrayal of what you experienced? Well, uh, well you know, you laughed. I laughed. Shawshank Redemption shows the fucking mundane order of things and how they fucking can step on you at all times. Uh, lockup. I was going to be a consultant on lockup, but I wanted to show how the guards are corrupt too. And they wouldn't let me do that. So they didn't <laughs> want me to do it because the guards are just as corrupt as they are. Yeah. I'm talking beatings. I was beaten once a month for 11 straight months because I was exposing the deaths that the prison killed three of my friends. There's an article online you could find. It's called, I compare the uh, United States prison to Abu Ghraib, uh, the old prison in Iraq mm -hmm. where they did the torture. Uh, when that was going on, I said, we have it going on right now in today's world. And we did. They killed like three of my friends. I wrote an article. Uh, I started fighting the prison system. When, I, when they, a friend of mine died in front of me, they said, oh, you saw him hit his head. And I told him, go fuck yourself. You motherfuckers killed that guy. He came from the medical with fucking chest pains. And they said, get out of here. You got gas. Drops dead right in front of me. And everybody knows you see a person drop dead. They first thing they do is they, you know, they shit and piss themselves or whatever it is. And he was dead right in front of us. And they did, they didn't give a fuck. They were laughing. It was a disgusting display of people trying to treat people like a human being. And the guy wasn't a big, he was an Indian. He only had 10 years. It wasn't like he fucking, he wasn't a murderer. He wasn't, he was a drug dealer and stuff. And they didn't give a fuck. They just don't give a fuck. Ugh. Well, um, on a lighter note, we are now to the portion of our show called Dinner Party Facts. And I know we already went over the ass knife. Do you have any other interesting or obscure facts that people can use at a dinner party or a bar to impress people about prison? Yeah, I do. Well, you know what? what? <laughs> you said it so earnestly. <laughs> well, uh, 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 here's the one. Everybody thinks you're going to get fucked in the shower. Yeah. And when you tell them, that's not where it happens. They go, what do you mean? Another one, they always say, oh, you know, you're going to drop the soap in prison. No, I wouldn't also bend my ass in front of a fucking five guys in the shower either. That's not a healthy <laughs> thing to do as well, but it's not where it happens. It happens in the cells and it happens pretty much every day, not just rapes. Some are rapes, some aren't. And uh, people think it's always going to be in the shower and it's going to be the big guy. And it's not, I never feared the biggest guy in prison. I feared the littlest guy who was the craziest guy because I watched them stab people and, and, and do some crazy shit. We had a guy who actually tied, <laughs> he fucking, he's a friend of ours. He goes crazy. He takes these two big, we call them swords. He had big shanks and he fucking tapes them with masking tape to his hand. And he's going down the stairs trying to stab everybody. Now the guards are coming running and they're telling us lock down and we're on a tier waiting. They're surrounding them. They're screaming, drop the knife, drop the knife. We're looking at, what are you fucking idiot? This guy's got a taste to his fucking hand. How are you going to fucking drop the knife? They end up fucking getting him down. And then they did, but he went crazy. He, Ozzy, you see a lot of that. There's more, here's the biggest problem you want to press someone is there's more mental health people in prison than, than people even have an idea of. 
And that's the problem more than anything. Yeah. Well, that is a fun dinner party. Fact. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> All right, Larry, well, thank you so much for Larry, joining thank us. You, thank you for being, I'm fascinated by prisons. I could talk about this all day. <laughs> his book, Gangster Redemption, is available through his website, realitycheckprogram.com, and his podcast, The Real Deal with Larry Lawton, is available on all major platforms, and go check out his YouTube as well. Thank you, Larry, for joining us. That was really fun. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate it. Uh, if you're ever at a party and someone comes up to you and goes, I don't reckon I can shove this knife up my ass, go, well, I don't know about that, and walk away. <laughs> 